Welcome to this week's Educator Helpline. I'm going to give it a sec for people to join us today. All right. So, welcome. If this is your first Educator Helpline, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is going to be a uh, an opportunity for us to present you with some uh, some activities that you can do within your own home that are related to ocean science. Um, today we're going to be talking about ocean literacy principle number two, which is the ocean and life in the ocean shape the features of Earth. But before we get into that, I wanted to explain the formatting a little bit of how this is going to go um, and get you started with our, our educator helpline. So this is a helpline. It's designed to be uh, somewhere for you to get support with activities that you can do within your own home. Um, it can be for teachers or parents or anyone who is looking for ocean science activities to do at their home. So if you have any questions while we're watching, while we're going through all of these, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Evie Bell is going to be answering any of your questions. So say hi in the comments to Evie and to me, and we'd love to hear a little bit about you and where you're joining us from, where you are watching, and, and how you found our page. So feel free to do that in the comments over on the side. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to explain the format of today and then we'll get into some activities. So the activities that we're going to be going through, we have three activities. One is going to talk about erosion, one is going to talk about sea level rise, and one is gonna talk a little bit about thermohaline circulation or the global ocean conveyor belt and how that influences uh, our, our land, our life on land. Today's activities, follow ocean literacy principle number two, but they also lead in really nicely to ocean literacy principle number three. Uh, starting last week, we are making sure that our activities align with the ocean literacy principles. If you want to learn more about those ocean literacy principles, that is in the comments to the side. There's a link to those so you can learn about that framework of how you can incorporate ocean literacy into your classroom um, and learn about the standards that we are following. So today is going to be ocean literacy principle number two. Next week we'll cover ocean literacy literacy principle number three. And if you missed last week's video, uh, that is available on our Facebook page as well. Um, you can check out ocean literacy principle number one. Get the whole set. All right. So ocean literacy principle number two, like I said before, is the ocean and light in the ocean shape the features of Earth. So we live on land, obviously. We haven't quite gotten the technology together to live in the ocean, although hopefully it'll it'll happen someday. Um, so our life, while we might not realize it, here on the coast we think about the ocean a lot, but even inland, our life is shaped by the ocean and, and the features that we live on, the mountains, the plains, all of those have been influenced by the ocean. So there's a few ways that the ocean can influence life. Um, it can change the landforms themselves, which is why we're going to talk about erosion. Erosion is a, a process where um, sediments or soils are taken from the land and moved to another place. It can be into the ocean, it can be into a river, um, but some sediment or soil is moved from one place to another, changing the landform itself. Over geologic timescales, the ocean can also rise and fall and cause moves on the actual continents themselves, um, changing subduction zones, uh, moving those tectonic plates around. You can have really large scale changes. Small scale changes are a lot easier to see in real time, which is why we're going to be doing an erosion activity today and not so much a landform moving activity. I, I don't know about you, but I don't have uh, several million years to sit around and watch some uh, landform processes happening. So what you're going to need for this first activity is a Tupperware container or some sort of clear container and then some sand, some water, and then you're going to need some uh, something to push the water. I'm going to use a Tupperware lid and we'll see what that's for in a second. And this is going to be our beach. Now if we if you live near the beach you have seen uh, the way the beach changes over time. Typically you have this nice slope. You would want that kind of gentle sloping on your beach, not a giant drop off. But after certain events like hurricanes or large storms or anything like that, you can see large changes in the structure and the form of that beach. 
So we're gonna mimic that today. We're actually not gonna do too strong of a, a hurricane or anything like that, um, but we're gonna look at how the waves change that beach erosion. So I'm going to get up, move behind the table and get started with our first activity. All right, so we have our container of water here. This is going to be our ocean and we're gonna add that to our container. And before you start this, you can have your students or your, your kids draw the outline of the beach itself and have a relief map of what that beach looked like so that they have something to compare it to before and after this erosion event. Now, once you have your beach in there, you might have some initial settlement happening already. My beach was not particularly stable, it turns out, uh, but I'm gonna speed that process up a little bit. I'm gonna take my, my Tupperware lid, my pushing instrument, and gently make waves. I'm not sure if you can see it, but immediately my beach has flattened out. I'm gonna bring this up to you so you can see it a little bit more. Depending on how strong your waves are or how much uh, space you have between those waves in the beach, this process can be faster or slower. Uh, but you can mimic that erosion process with some pretty easy at home materials. If you want to take it a step further and make it into a sort of challenge, you can make it into an engineering question of how do I stop this erosion? A lot of techniques that scientists and engineers and buildings, construction workers and, and planners will use in order to combat erosion, things like planting native plants and vegetation along that. Uh, that sand line there. You can also put in man-made constructs, uh, things like fences or walls that will actually stop that wave action from hitting. So you can try to make it a challenge for your students, for your kids to stop that erosion, makes that process uh, less impactful. For us living on the coast, we might see things like this after a hurricane with a large shelf next to the beach. And we don't really want that, especially with really expensive houses along that coastline. We're not huge fans of that erosion happening. Um, so trying to engineer solutions for this and help those people who are living along the coastline is a really great tool, a really great task to put your students to. All right, so that's our sort of short timeline, time scale activity. The next activity is going to be with sea level rise. So not only does the land itself uh, move with erosion with the water acting on it. We can also have the water just cover it up and change levels. Again, on the coast, we are all too familiar with sea level rise. Uh, we see it on sunny day floods and all kinds of uh, water in the streets and in places that it really shouldn't be. So we are particularly susceptible to sea level rise and, and sensitive to it. And so it's something that we want to look at. But if we look at geologic timescales, our sea level rise that we're seeing now is kind of comparatively. 50 million years ago or more, our coastline was completely different. Instead of the coast being here where we're familiar with it on maps, it was at this line up here. The sea actually covered most of South Carolina. And that's actually why you can find fossils, marine fossils, places inland really far inland, you'll still find things like shark teeth and megalodon teeth and, and marine mammal fossils found really far inland. So that happens because of sea level rise and fall. Sea level rise can happen for a couple of different reasons. It's going to be either because of thermal expansion. So when water gets warm, it expands, just like if you have a gas and it heats up, that will expand as well. Um, and so if you put a balloon or something like that over a flame, it's going to pop. All right, so thermal expansion causes it to expand and rise. So because that water is taking up more space, it's going to move up onto the land. Another thing that can happen is ice melting. So we wanna look at ice melting for our next activity. So over here, this set containers is our activity. I set this up beforehand because I want to watch ice melt for a little while. I've been going for about an hour. You can speed up the process with a heat lamp or a hair dryer or anything that will like heat ice. But there are two that we want to look at. We want to look at sea ice, things like glacier or things like icebergs. I also want to look at ice that is locked in the land. So glaciers or ice sheets. 
like you would find in Greenland or in Antarctica. Things melt. Does the same thing happen? Is the question examining today. Does melting sea ice have the same impact as melting glaciers? As climate change, which we'll get really into depth with next week, this is a really important question. We want to be able to predict how rates of sea level rise and to learn about where that sea level rise can mitigate this, make this a little bit better. So over on this side, I put two ice previously froze the night before, which was straight into the ice. Once I put those in the water, I marked with tape here. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a black tape line level is. So we want to see the water rise as the ice melts. And here, I want to mimic this one as closely as possible. I want to replicate my experience as closely as possible. Make sure that those results are valid. So over here, I put my sea ice in there and put that tape line to measure where, where that water level was before. The water in here is salt water. I had just mixed up some salt in that water before. I make it salty. If you want to get really fancy, you can use a refractometer or a salinity measure. If you have an at-home aquarium or something like that, you can measure the salinity and make it as close to salinity as possible, which in the open ocean would be around. Or closer to land, you might have an estuary here, and you can make it. But you can look at the difference in salinity when that fresh water melts. All right, so we have our salt water and our sea ice. And on this side, I clearly put the ice cubes up on top. So this is representing our glaciers or our sea or our uh, ice sheets. This is the water is not conducting that heat and melting the ice really quickly. So over here, my sea ice has pretty much completely melted. My glacier is still standing, but standing strong. What you'll see in these two experiments is over here the line that I marked on. The, uh, the container on the outside is below where the water line is now. The water has risen on this side here. The reason for that is water displaces water. Ice will displace water. So when I put the ice directly in the water, it was displacing the volume of that ice. So when, even when it melted, its volume was still the same. It took up the same things that it was taking up as an ice sheet. Whereas over here, this ice is not touching the water it's not displacing the water but it melts it moves into this basin and it causes this level to rise so what you want to see is can your students predict what will happen before it melts and can they explain why and then try to come up with an explanation for why did this sea level rise over here and this sea level stayed the same if they're older students you should be able to get them to come up with the answer to that. Younger students might have a little bit of trouble with that. Uh, but another thing that's interesting to talk about is where that water stayed. You can see really clearly over here, there's a layer of purple water on top. That's the fresh, cold water that was in those ice cubes that has melted and it's just settled on top over here. The same thing is happening on this side. We have our distinct band of water on top and our salt clear water underneath. It's just happening a little bit slower. Why does that matter though? So when ice melts, it is fresh water. When seawater freezes into glaciers or into icebergs, it pushes the salt out and only the fresh water freezes. As a result, you have really, really cold water that sinks down to the bottom. It's full of salt that ends up down at the bottom of the ocean. When cold water that is really, really salty. Iceberg froze and pushed all out. When it sinks to the bottom, it pushes other water out of the That movement of water drives what's called thermohaline circulation. This is the global ocean conveyor belt. And ocean water is constantly moving around the planet. When it moves, it's not moving by itself. It's taking uh, air temperatures with it. It's taking heat with it. It's taking hands with it. So this global ocean circulation is really, really important for life on Earth. It's huge impacts on climate, which again we'll talk about next week. Um, but that pattern 
of ice melting and reforming in the in the cold uh, poles drives all of that ocean circulation. So oceans have two types of currents. They have surface currents and they have deep currents. Those deep currents are driven by density changes. When water is really, really cold or really, really salty, it is more dense and it sinks. So you have all these different packets of water in the ocean that are moving around. It's not moving particularly fast. It can take a droplet of water a thousand years or so to move through the ocean conveyor belt, uh, but it is a really, really critical part of life here on Earth. That conveyor belt, it didn't have some issues with climate change. We're starting to see um, in places that traditionally would have really, really cold water, we're seeing some warm water in, uh, species appearing in the fossil there. So we can compare taking a core down from the bottom of the sea and um, we can compare the life that we find in there, the fossilized life through geologic time to what we're seeing now. And we're seeing a really drastic change in, in species composition of different places on earth that should have cold species and are now having much warmer water species. That could have really big impacts on life as a whole on earth. We need the, the transport of the nutrients from that cold water moving through the deep ocean where all those sediments and all those nutrients have settled down to the bottom. We need that water to keep moving in order to bring those nutrients back to feed ocean foods and to, to continue life as we know it on this planet. I'm not saying life is going to end on this planet by any means. Uh, it will change depending on how the ocean is impacted by uh, climate change. All right, to demonstrate that principle of density, how warm water rises and cold water sinks. We have one last activity. I'm going to step back here and do a little dance for you guys today. It's like the hokey pokey, step forward, step back, something like that. All right, so for this activity, I need a container of water that's relatively tall. This is just cold room temperature water. Um, and then you're going to get a smaller container that fits inside that larger container. I've attached two strings to it so that I can lower it into my container. So I have it securely fastened to lower down into that room temperature water. And in this, I have put a couple of drops of food coloring. I'm going to put some hot water into this container. Before you add this container into your larger container, if you're doing this with students, you want to have them predict what's going to happen. If I lower this, container of water very carefully so I don't spill it everywhere into this container of cooler water, what's going to happen? What's your hypothesis? An if-then statement could be, if I lower this into this container, then nothing will happen. It will just stay in its little container or it will sink to the bottom and fall over because my hands aren't very steady and it just kind of went wherever it wanted to go. So we're going to lower this in here and see what we find. I'll try to do it as carefully as possible, not to spill anything. All right. Now, you can see that that water is rising up out of our little warm container. Even after I put it down in there, there was an initial kind of plume up as I was lowering it down. But even as it's sitting at the bottom, that colored water is rising through the water column from our cold water container. And the reason for this, that density change that we talked about previous, so that warm water at the bottom was less dense than the cold water. And so it moved up through that water bottom. This is what we would see at things like hydrothermal. You would see the water coming up and rising through the water column and taking kinds of nutrients and having all of these uh, life forms living around it. Um, and so we would see that it like hydrothermal vents. But it's a really good demonstration of the different ways that water can be less and more dense. Last week we talked about uh, layering colored water with different salinities. You can look at that, uh, that video after we're in here today. And so you can look at how those different densities change the circulation of the ocean. As that ocean water circulates, we have that global conveyor belt that changes life on Earth. So we have our ocean life in the ocean shaping the features of Earth. The last activity that I wanted to talk about briefly, one of the sub-principles of ocean literacy principle two, 
talks about where sand comes from. Right now, we don't have the luxury of going to the beach and sand, but you might have some around the house in places that kind of escaped your, your gaze when you were cleaning, or maybe you collect sand from different If you do that, that's perfect for this activity because sand comes from the minerals and the, the, the rocks that are around um, around the location, as well as the life that lives there as well. So things like diatoms, little tiny, crunchy glass-like organisms um, will die and leave the hard shells behind. Or corals, you'll find really white sandy beaches in places that have coral reefs. And then around here, we have quartz in our sands. You see kind of glass-like pebbles. But you can take sand, and if you have a microscope or a magnifying glass or things like look at it really really closely and try to imagine where did that come from did it come from land most sand originates or did it come from the ocean in cases like the coral reef sand being really really white you can see sand like in hawaii and volcanic beaches being really really dark and black from that igneous rock coming up and being weathered and eroded so if you have a, a microscope or even some phone cameras can get really really zoomed in and you can see stuff you can also search online for uh, pictures of sand under microscopes from different locations and try to come up with where those sand particles originated. All right, several different activities about ocean literacy principle number two. Um, I had a couple of questions come in, so I'm going to look at that real quick. All right, can you explain sunning? I can do my best. <laughs> so sunny flooding is when you have uh, flooding that happens when it's not raining. It's not. It should flooding by any kind of obvious mechanism. But what will happen on sunny day flooding is tides will come in and influence where that water goes. Uh, tides will also influence the the, uh, the currents in the ocean. And along the coast here, we live really, really close to sea level, under sea level. Um, just small fluctuations in the tide bringing in water at the coastline, you can see these huge swings in where that water is hitting and where that water is inundating. So with sunny day flooding, you'll have this really, really high, say it's around new moon or full moon, um, you'll have a really high tide with that moon pulling the water far um, into the, the coastline here. And so you'll see this, this flood it's just because the water is moved. No, it's not a, a huge source of water that's visible to us necessarily. Um, the, the tides for us. Any information um, on flooding and sea level rise? We have really, really great uh, resources on NOAA's sea level rise viewer, and you can be part of the uh, sea level rise investigation and how we track it and hopefully predict where it's going to be a problem. So on NOAA's website, you can check that out and hopefully help out our with tracking sea level rise and, and making life better for all of us in the, the long run. All right, in the comments about climate change being why we're seeing in like and fish off of our yeah, so we are seeing some great, uh, well, not great, some really huge movements in uh, life. Uh, things like lionfish, like uh, Susan mentioned here, and waters are warming, so have impacts on the global circulation. The way that the ocean is is uh, influencing our coast, we also see that influencing the lives around there. So, invasive species like lionfish, those are those are found naturally in Indo-Pacific regions. It's not supposed to be in our waters. They don't have any natural predators. They are causing huge issues off of our coast and eat, eat everything, and don't have any anything that would eat them. They have venomous spines that would make some kind of a unpleasant meal for our native species here. Our native and so we think that it, they probably did from somewhere in Florida when a hurricane hit, they, they got loose or potentially uh, someone let them out and wanted them to be free. Pets, don't let them free. <laughs> they don't need that. Um, they, they would be taken care of a sweet life uh, with you at your home and they can cause problems. Like Yellow-bellied sliders and red-eared sliders. Red-eared sliders are species that we have huge issues with. Um, but and fish. We do see those now, um, and they are traveling further and further up the coast. We're also seeing changes in the ranges of uh, lots of different organisms, even natural species or native species. We're seeing a change in the ranges of them because of changes in ocean circulation and ocean 
warmer and warming waters? Good questions. All right, I think that's the question. Um, so if you have any more questions, either leave us a comment on this video act and we'd be happy to get back with you or you can email Kristen Gearing or Evie Bell um, at C Grant um, to answer any of your questions. We're so happy that you joined us today. If you want more information about climate change and some activities to go along with a topic, that's what we're going to be covering next year, same time, same place. So 4 p.m. Wednesday, I believe it's May 7th, will be our topic for next week, Ocean Literacy Principle number three, uh, the way that the ocean impacts weather and climate. I know that I've been enjoying this really long spring, so maybe we can learn about that, why some years have these crazy swings. It's, it seems like a normal season. So thanks again for joining us. We will see you next week.